I'd invite you to take a Bible and turn back with me to the little book of Ruth in the Old Testament. Back to Ruth chapter 4. On Sunday evenings in recent weeks, we have been in the little book of Ruth. And here at the end of this little book in Ruth chapter 2, we want to take just a few moments with a quick look back at where we have been. What I would like to do is to read with you from a little book that has been very helpful to me in preparing these lessons, a little book on Ruth called A Sweet and Bitter Providence. In one section of this book, as it looks back on the little book of Ruth and what that book is all about, the writer says this, at one level, the message of the book of Ruth is that the life of the godly is not a straight line to glory, but they do get there. The life of the godly is not an interstate through Nebraska. Get that picture in your mind. If you've ever driven through Nebraska or Kansas, you know exactly what the author is talking about. He says the life of the godly is not an interstate through Nebraska, but a state road through the Blue Ridge Mountains of Tennessee. Some of us get car sick just looking at a picture like that. There are rock slides and precipices and dark mists and bears and slippery curves and hairpin turns that make you go backward in order to go forward. But all along this hazardous, twisted road that doesn't let you see very far ahead, there are frequent signs that say the best is yet to come. Taken as a whole, the story of Ruth is one of those signs. It was written to give us encouragement and hope that all the perplexing turns in our lives are going somewhere good. They do not lead off a cliff. In all the setbacks of our lives as believers, God is plotting for our joy. We tried to see that throughout the book of Ruth. You think back to where we have been, how taken chapter by chapter, the book of Ruth just seems to be one setback after another. In Ruth chapter 1, we've got a famine that forces Naomi and her family to leave their homeland in Judah. Naomi's husband dies while they are there. Her two sons marry Moabite women. For ten years they live in the land of Moab. No children are born in those relationships. No grandchildren born to Naomi. Her sons eventually die in the land of Moab. And here she is as an older woman left with two Moabite daughters-in-law. Eventually, she makes her way back home with one of those daughters-in-law. And as she is greeted back home, she says in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 20, to those who are welcoming her back, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. That literally means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Many setbacks in Ruth chapter 1. In Ruth chapter 2, Naomi is filled with some new hope as Boaz, a distant relative, appears on the scene as a possible future husband for Ruth. But he doesn't make any big moves. He shows some kindness and compassion, but the chapter ends with suspense and a great deal of uncertainty. 
In Ruth chapter 3, as we studied a couple of weeks ago on Sunday evening, Naomi and Ruth make a risky move in the middle of the night. In Ruth chapter 3 and verse 9, we find Ruth coming to Boaz at midnight, him asking who this is, and she answers, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. But we noticed the character of this man, Boaz, understanding that there is another man who has a prior claim, a more pressing claim to marry Ruth, and Boaz will not proceed without giving this man his lawful opportunity. And as we're reading through this, it's very natural, very easy for us to get to the end of Ruth chapter 3 and to have our heartstrings tugged and our emotions engaged with everything that we know, we know. We don't want this other nameless man to end up with Ruth. We want her to end up with Boaz with everything that we've learned about her and everything that we've learned about him. About him. Life is not a straight line leading from one blessing to the next and then finally to heaven. I quote with you again from this little book. Life is a winding and troubled road. Switchback after switchback. And the point, listen to what he's saying, the point of biblical stories like Joseph and Job and Esther and Ruth. The point of those stories is to help us feel in our bones, not just know in our heads that God is for us. In all these strange terms, God is not showing up after the trouble and cleaning it up. He is plotting the course and managing the troubles with far-reaching purposes for our good and for His glory. We turn in our Bibles back to Ruth chapter 4 where we find more setbacks. Ruth chapter 1, setbacks. Ruth chapter 2, setbacks. Ruth chapter 3, switchbacks and setbacks. In Ruth chapter 4, you begin reading with me in verse 1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. And again, our heartstrings are tough. Because we know a whole lot about Boaz and we don't know a whole lot about this man. And with everything that we have learned, we don't want Ruth to end up with this man. We want Ruth to end up with Boaz. Boaz knows what he's doing. So far, the Redeemer has heard simply about the land that is available. Then Boaz in verse 5 said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot 
redeem it. Upon hearing what, or more accurately, who comes along with the land, the Redeemer steps away from the deal. We don't know if he was married. We don't know if he doesn't like the idea that Ruth is a Moabite. There's a lot that we don't know. But upon hearing what Boaz inserts into the discussion from verse 5, the Redeemer steps away. In verse 7, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting it in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and to all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon, her two sons. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among the brothers and from the gate of his native place You are witnesses this day. But if we think carefully, perhaps there is even another setback. This is a young woman who was married for 10 years without a child. A prayer of blessing is offered in verse 11 for Boaz and for Ruth. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah. We think back to Genesis 29 and Genesis 30 that tells us a great deal about the sons that were born to these two wives of Jacob. How they are mothers of many of the patriarchs in this great nation of Israel. And now the prayer for Boaz and for Ruth is, May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. And then we have this incredible phrase. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception. And she bore a son. It sounds an awful lot like what the Genesis writer records concerning Leah, for instance. In Genesis 29 and verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. It sounds a lot like we read what we read in Genesis 30 and verse 22. Then God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. Here at the end, of this journey, Boaz takes Ruth as his wife. The Lord gives her conception and she bears a son. You've got your Bibles open there to Ruth chapter 4. Notice in the 14th verse how the focus briefly shifts back to Naomi. In Ruth chapter 4 and verse 14, Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. And may His name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. Why? In Ruth chapter 4, for just a moment, does the focus shift? Not just to 
the father Boaz and the mother Ruth, but to the grandmother Naomi. I would suggest to you for those of us who've been paying careful attention since Ruth chapter 1, Ruth 4 sweetly closes the bitter circle for Naomi. The story began with Naomi's losses. It ends with Naomi's gain. It began with death and it ends with birth. A son has been born. At one time in Ruth chapter 1, she felt completely empty. Now she is full in a completely new way. And notice what they named this little boy. In Ruth chapter 4 and verse 17, they named him Obed. That doesn't mean a whole lot to you and me. In Hebrew, that word means, that name means servant or worshiper. A son has been born to Naomi. They named him servant. They named him Worshipper. And here's how it ends. Ruth chapter 4, verse 17. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Could I suggest to you a couple of vital concluding takeaways before we close our time together on this magnificent little book? Thank God, number one, for glimpses into the reality that so much more is going on than we imagine. We've tried hard in recent months to grow in our appreciation of that. For three months down the hall, on Wednesday evenings, we talked about the providence of God and leaning on Him. Then we brought that study into the auditorium on Wednesday evenings. For an entire quarter, we tried to grow in our appreciation of the fact that there is a God, and I'm not Him, you're not Him. And now as one more little case study, we've gone back and, and we've looked in detail at this precious little book that reminds us we ought to thank God for glimpses Little glimpses into the reality that so much more is going on than we can imagine. Read with me the very last paragraph of this book. Ruth chapter 4 and verse 18. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amminadab. Amminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David, who became the greatest king in all of the history of Israel. Again, I would read to you from this little helpful book. The book of Ruth wants to teach us that God's purpose for His people is to connect us to something far greater than ourselves. God wants us to know that when we follow Him, our lives always mean more than we think they do. Naomi had no idea in the land of Moab that God was making her an ancestor of the Messiah. For the Christian, there is always a connection between the ordinary events of life and the stupendous work of God in history. Everything we do in obedience to God, no matter how small, is significant. It is part of a cosmic mosaic that God is painting to display the greatness of His power and wisdom to the world and to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. A deep satisfaction of the Christian life 
is that we are not given over to trifles. Serving a widowed mother-in-law, gleaning in a field, falling in love, having a baby. For the Christian, these things are all connected to eternity. They are part of something so much bigger than they seem. Thank God for little glimpses into the reality that so much more is going on than we imagine. Number two, God is able to accomplish His purposes in breathtaking ways. You remember where this study began. You remember what it was like to live during the days of Naomi and Boaz and Ruth. Judges chapter 21, the end of that great book. This is the very last statement. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Ruth chapter 1 and verse 1 places us squarely in that context. This is what it's like to live at that point in time. But even then, God was able to accomplish His purposes. We go from Ruth chapter 1 verse 1 in a day when everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes to the very end of Ruth chapter 4. And we see that God was at work all along in breathtaking ways. Perhaps no passage of Scripture shows us that more clearly than in Matthew chapter 1, where we go forward 3,000 years, and this is what we find. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In verse 5, we find the name of Boaz. Boaz, who was the father of Obed, Boaz was married to Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David the king. All along, we've been reading about the great-grandparents of the greatest king in Israel's history. And even more than that, we follow Matthew's train of thought all the way down to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 16, and we read of a man named jo Jacob, who was the father of a man named Joseph, who eventually came to be the husband of Mary. Mary, who bore Jesus, who is called Christ. God is able to accomplish His purposes in breathtaking ways. You turn in your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 22. That leads us to point number three. May the Redeemer be renowned. That's what we read in Ruth chapter 4, and it is especially true of the great Redeemer who came into the world via this family line. In Matthew chapter 22, this Jesus, in verse 41, eventually had grown up. Pharisees are gathered together. And this Jesus, who is a product of this family line that we've been reading about, asks those Pharisees in Matthew chapter 22 a question. The question is this, what do you think about the Christ Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. It was a well-known fact that the Messiah would eventually come from the family line of David, who was a great-grandchild of Boaz and of Ruth. And so then Jesus asks this question of the Pharisees. How is it then that David in the Spirit called him Lord? Saying all the way back in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
Yahweh, Jehovah, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Why would David refer to his offspring as Lord? If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The point is this. This family line was preserved by God so that the Lord, the Christ, the Redeemer might eventually come. This is how it relates to you and to me. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, Paul looks back now in hindsight on the work of this Christ and he says, Christ redeemed us. In Ruth chapter 4, it was a matter of land and retaining a family name and making sure that a lineage was preserved. Here we're talking about so much more and not just in one pocket of one nation, but in all of the nations of the earth. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. In Titus 2, He gave Himself for us to redeem not a bunch of land, but to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. It was said of him while he was still in the womb, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. It was said at the very end of God's written revelation, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Here was a great grandmother who had no idea. Here were great grandparents who could not possibly conceive. May the Redeemer be renowned. Finally, if this book shows us anything, surely it shows us the best is yet to come. One more time, I'd like to read from this very helpful little book. The life of the godly is not a straight line. Not a straight line to glory but the godly do get there. God sees to it. There is a hope for us beyond the cute baby and the happy grandmother. The story points forward to David. David points forward to Jesus. And Jesus points forward to the resurrection of our mortal bodies. You think of Romans chapter 8. We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. The redemption of our bodies. When in the language of Revelation 21 He will wipe away every tear. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. The best is yet to come. That is the unshakable truth about the life of the woman and the man who follow Christ in the obedience that flows from faith. I say it to the young who are strong and hopeful, and I say it to the old 
for whom the outer nature is quickly wasting away. The best is yet to come. And God is at work in the darkest of your times to get you there. Thanks be to God for that wonderful truth. In spite of famine of various sorts, maybe it's a literal famine, the way that we read about in Ruth chapter 1. Maybe it's the famine of a spouse that we would love to have and never have. Maybe it's the famine of a child that we desperately want and are never blessed with. Maybe it's the famine of some sort of outward circumstance or luxury. Whatever it is, in spite of famine, in spite of barrenness, in spite of lost opportunities, in spite of seemingly supposed setbacks, in spite of unforeseen challenges, in spite of gut wrenching heartbreak. The best is yet to come. I appreciate so very much your kind attention and your encouragement throughout this little series. I hope that it has been as helpful for you as it has been for me in studying to present it to you. We want to make sure that before we close this evening, you have the opportunity to prepare for the best. Life here on this earth is not the best. Life here on this earth is not the end. The descendant, ultimately, that we have been reading about, the descendant that came from this family line, eventually gave his life so that we could know, even 2,000 years later, halfway around the world, the best is yet to come. He was in the grave for three days, but he's not there anymore. To show us, to prove to us, the best is yet to come. And once he had raised from the dead, he said, you go into all the world and you spread this good news. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. It was boldly preached in the center of Jerusalem. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you need to respond to that even this very evening? If you're a child of God and you've lost sight of the fact that the best is yet to come and you've given in to the, the mirages of this world and you've made foolish trades and you know that you need to begin following Him again, the best is yet to come for those who are willing to follow Jesus. If we can be of any help whatsoever, would you let us know how by coming to the front while we stand and sing?